Good morning, everyone. I just want to welcome everyone here today. Uh, welcome to those uh, here in the Zoom meeting and even those who are watching um, the YouTube live stream. I just thank God for gathering us here together. And I will be speaking to us today. Amen. And when I first found out uh, that I will be speaking, it was honestly a shock. Uh, because I wasn't really told in person. I was, I just found out through the Telegram announcements when they showed the dates and I showed and I saw my name and I was like, Lord, wow. Um, you know, um, I, I like this is really like one of my first times doing this, but you know, I believe, you know, God has called me to ascend in my worship through this. And so I really thank God for this opportunity, for this privilege of being able uh, to speak to us today as a body of Christ. And, you know, when I was thinking of my topic, I was honestly really confused. I, I was, I remember my conversation with God, like, God, you know, what do you want me to say? Uh, what do you want to share with your body? Uh, because, you know, as a church, you know, pastor has been talking to us about the bridegroom King, you know, um, heaven and all these different things. And I'm like, God, I don't think I, I could speak about these things. And, you know, the Lord reminded me, you know, Angelo, Pastor has been doing this for over for 40 years, and this is like your first time, it's okay. And you know, God has really shown me the importance and you know and 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 comfort, you know, that it's okay to uh it's okay to go back to the basics. And so uh for this time, I just wanna share with us, you know, an understanding of the love that God has for us. And another thing that you know I was worried about you know, it was my time. But you know, if we go 20 minutes, if we go two hours, all glory to God. Uh, but I'm pretty sure we're not going to go two hours. But anyways, um, this is the topic that I have for us today. I'm um, understanding the love that God has for us. And the reason why I chose this is because throughout these past couple of months, I really feel in my heart, you know, God has been wanting to share and wanting to greater reveal um his love for us and you know god has also shown me that and from what i've seen that many believers really don't have or many believers don't have a lot of confidence in the love that god has for for them and you know what why do i say that uh because from my personal observations on myself and upon you know listening to others and their and their stories you know i noticed that many of us lack confidence in ourselves in our abilities and in our experiences but i've grown to realize the wonderful truth that through the love that god has for me I am enough. And it is through this truth that I am empowered to have confidence in myself because when I truly know that I am enough in the eyes of God, then I should see myself with that, you know, sense of worth as well. And unfortunately, you know, many Christians fall into this thinking of self-deprecation. Uh, so it is in my heart to share with us an understanding of the love that God has for us. Uh, because when we understand the love of God, the more we are able to have confidence in it. And something that I also see that many believers deal with in the body of Christ is having a hard time approaching God in times of, of sin and in times of failure. And, you know, it is my hope uh, and it is in my heart also uh, for us to understand that his love for us will, that understanding his love for us should encourage us, should greatly encourage us to go into his presence with a passion and a great desire for him in times of our weakness. And so um, for this teaching today, you know, God has shown me five things that I want to share with us regarding, you know, his love for us. And before we continue, you know, I just want to pray for us. So, Father God, I just want to thank you, God, for today. I thank you for gathering us here in this place, Lord, to worship, to praise, and to magnify your name. I pray, oh God, that as we enter into this time of message, Lord, uh, I pray, oh God, that your word, that your heart, Lord, may, re may be revealed today, Lord, as we discuss and as we um, uh discover lord and and go on this journey lord on the understanding of the love that you have for us oh god i pray that you continue to open up the eyes of our hearts to open the eyes of our understandings that as you grant us uh holy spirit lord the wisdom uh the, uh, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, Lord, I pray, oh God, that we may grow in the knowledge of Christ. And I just want to thank you, oh God, for this time, for this opportunity, and for this privilege, Lord, of being able to share your heart, Lord. I just want to thank you, God. I glorify you. We magnify you. We praise you. And let your name be lifted up high in this place today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So I want to share with us five things uh, that God has shared with that ha, that God has shown me, you know, regarding His love uh, for me and for all of us. And so, uh, number one, when we are loved by God, He ensures that we are restored when we go to Him. 
And so uh, for some of these points, I'm going to be sharing with us some scenarios uh, so that we can better understand and relate to the points that we'll be exploring today. And so for this, uh, I'm going to give us a scenario. Let's say that for a period of time, you felt like you've drifted away from God because of any type of sin, whether it be idolatry or anything else uh, with something or someone, you acknowledge your sin and you repent, but now you feel like you're in a stage once again, and you, but now you feel like you're in stage one again in your relationship with God. The ministries that you were once active in now feel hard to do because you think you don't belong there anymore due to your recent wrongdoing. I know I've personally, I've personally felt this way uh, as I am a part of the worship team and there are seasons or and there are seasons in my life where I'm in sin. And when I finally get out of that season of sin, I feel like I'm a new Christian once again. And I basically have to work back to where I once was from the very beginning. And, you know, if if any of us have ever felt this way, let me tell you that there is such comfort in the love of God. Yes, we may have sinned, but there is restorative power in the love that the Father has for us when he forgives us. The truth is, we don't need to start from the beginning at all. We are simply placed back to where we once were in our relationship with him. And so I just want to share with us Luke 15 verses 18 to 24. And this is a story of the prodigal son. And let's just read from verse 18. Uh, It says here, I will arise and go to my father and I will say to him, father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. Verse 20. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and run and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight and am no longer worthy to be called your son. Verse 22. But the father said to his servants, bring out the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet and bring the fatted calf here and kill it and let us celebrate and be merry for this is my for this my son was dead and is alive again he was lost and is found again and it and is found and they began to be merry and i just want us to look back at verse 18 it says there I will arise and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And I want us to see that when the prodigal son, you know, when he was planning to approach his father, it was in his mind that he had already lost his position as his son and instead saw himself as lesser value, you know, as being a servant. He believed in his mind that because of his wrongdoings, because of his rebellion, you know, he can no longer call himself a son before his father. But yet the father does something amazing that truly encapsulates the love that father God has for us. And uh, in verse 22, you know, it shows that, you know, but the father said to his servants, bring out the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet and bring the fatted calf here and kill it and let us eat and be merry for this is my son. for this my son was dead and is alive again he was lost and is found and they began to marry you know the father instead welcomes and celebrates the return of his son to him and even accepts his son as his own once again and even lavishes his son with the best of the best right and this is the heart of the father for us It is in his heart to restore us when we come to him. And so, you know, a lot of us here are church leaders and worship leaders and whatever position, you know, that God has given you in this church, in this body of Christ. And and we have sinned, but yet we have repented and gone back to the Lord. Let it be known that the restorative power of the love of God has made us again worthy of our positions in the body of Christ. You know, I pray that we may be free from the enemy's deception that when we sin, you know, we are not worthy to do our respective ministries. But let us continue to hold on to the truth that there will always be restoration in the love of God. And so understanding that there is restoration, understanding that when we come to God, we are restored. You know, this should greatly encourage us and this should greatly empower us to always continue to run to the Father whenever we sin, whenever we fall short, because there is hope, because there is comfort in the truth, you know, that God will bring forth restoration upon each and every one of us. Amen. And so let's go to number two. It says here, God's love is not about failure or success. It's about response. And when I was diving into this part of my preaching, God has given me a lot of comfort. Uh, He has given me a lot of 
um, encouragement, you know, uh, about this truth that it is not about failure or success when it comes to him. It's all about how we respond to his love. And so I want to give to us another scenario. And so there are many times in my walk with God uh, where he calls me to do something that is beyond my comfort zone. And there are times I am so hesitant to act upon his calling because of the uncertainty of whether or not I will fail or succeed. But recently, God has shown me that he desires for us to step out in faith because he doesn't look at whether we fail or succeed when we do something. He instead looks at whether or not we have faith to respond, you know, to his call to step out of our comfort zone, to step out into the unknown, to step out into the uncertainty. But unfortunately, the uncertainty of failure, you know, the uncertainty of whether or not this or that will happen is something that many believers deal with. And it is sadly has hindered a lot of us. It has hindered me a lot as well, you know, and from stepping out in faith when he calls me to do it, when he calls us to do it. But when we, when we remember that in his love, he looks at the response rather than the outcome, we should be emboldened to embrace the unknown things that God leads us to. You know, if we succeed, we thank God for allowing us to increase in our capacity and faith towards him to use us. But if we fail, you know, God still admires us for being obedient towards him. God uses failures to teach us lessons about our walk with him. In Proverbs 24, verse 16, it says here, For a righteous man falls seven times and rises again, but the wicked stumble in time of disaster and collapse. And so failure really is a part of our walk with God. But let's remember that God would rather have us fail in obedience over succeed in disobedience. You know, even if we fail because of our disobedience, God will still turn whatever the enemy meant for evil and he will turn it for his good. You know, when we look at the prophet Elijah, after a great act of faith, showing that our God is indeed the real God, you know, when Jezebel talked about wanting to kill him, he fleed away in fear. You know, yet God supplied for him and he is now known as one of the most powerful of God's prophets and was taken away to heaven without experiencing death. When we look at the apostle Paul, he has failed with his history with persecuting Christians, yet God transformed him to be a man that would still impact us today with his writings and epistles. You know, King David failed when he committed adultery and murder, yet God still used him and transformed him to now be known as the one who is after God's own heart. And so in his love, God does not look at ability, but rather at response. So let us be encouraged to take more steps of faith and pray for the fear of failure to be freed from us. And this to me has given me a lot of encouragement, has given me a lot of comfort because I believe that we as a church are ascending in faith. We as a church are ascending in the spontaneity in our relationship with God. And I believe that God has been leading us and God has been showing us many things that he wants us to do. And so when God shows us and wants us to do something, you know, let us find comfort that, you know, he's not going to look at whether we fail or succeed. He's When we fail, he's not going to scold us. He's not going to berate us. But, you know, he encourages us to act in faith, to step out in faith, because it is it's, it is in his desire that we grow in faith, that we grow to trust and to love him, you know? And so when we have an understanding of his love for us, when we have an understanding that he looks at response rather than the outcome of what we do, you know, our God can use us to do many miraculous things. You know, our relationship with God is kind of like trial and error. You know, we grow in our relationship with him as we grow and as we mature in our relationship with god you know he will call us to do many different things and you know when we respond to that call you know we are taking a great step of faith and we know that there are risks to that you know that's why a lot of people have a hard time you know stepping out of faith because of the risk that 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 are placed there you know but when we take those risks and when we put our faith and trust in God you know God can do miraculous things in our relationship with him he will show us many things that we thought we couldn't do and we and yet we could still do it right and so I really encourage us and God really desires for us to really step out in faith because he desires for us to do many miraculous things in his name in the ministry for his kingdom you know and you know, when we act in faith, there is so much comfort that his love is always behind us. His love is always uh, surrounding us and that there is and that his love for us will never, you know, uh, disappear. Amen. And so number three, I just want to share with us here. It says, by his love, God looks at us with great admiration. And I want us to read Isaiah 43 verse four. It says here, 
Since you were precious in my sight, you have been honored and I have loved you. Therefore, I will give men for you and, and people for your life. And, you know, reading Isaiah, it gives me so much, uh, the reading this verse, it gives us so much comfort to know that when God looks at us, he looks as, uh, he looks at us as his precious children. You know, he looks at us with, with so much love and with so much honor. And when we look at Solomon, uh, Song of Solomon verses four, uh, chapter four, verses seven and nine, it says here, every part of you is so beautiful my darling perfect is your beauty without flaw within for you reach into my heart with one flash of your eyes i am undone by your love my beloved my equal my bride you have left you leave me breathless i am overcome by merely a glance from your worshiping eyes for you have stolen my heart I am held hostage by your love and by the graces of righteousness shining upon you. And so in Isaiah, we see that when God looks at us as his children, he looks at us with so much admiration, with so much love and honor, and he sees us as his precious, uh, you know, children. And at Song of Solomon, we see uh, Jesus Christ, our bridegroom king, seeing us as his bride, being so beautiful, being perfect in our beauty and, you know, without flaw and within. And he, he declares to us that even with one glance to him, you know, we have stolen his heart. And, you know, when we really understand how God and how he desires to, to, to look at us, you know, he does not look at our current state of being. He does not look at you know, the fact that, oh, we have sinned. So now we are a sinner forever. No, you know, he looks at, he looks through the the lens of his eternal plan. And, you know, God sees us as the bride of Christ and he will continue to see us as the bride of Christ because he desires to see us fulfilled as the bride of Christ. Amen. And so we are, we should be moved by the truth that God delights at the sight of us. Earlier, we talked about failure. And when we, and when many of us do, I just want us to find comfort in the truth that our father does not see us. So he does not see us as failures. He does not see us as unworthy uh, beings. You know, he yet sees us as his precious children and beloved bride for Christ. And because of this, you know, he is so moved and he is so touched when we move in faith, when we step out in faith, when we just ascend a little bit more, you know, in our relationship with him, because he sees us with so much love, because he sees us with so much adoration even little growths in our relationship with him, he greatly admires and he really congratulates us and celebrates. And so it is through his love that God always sees the best in us. And I want us to continue to remember that, that God always sees the best in us because I know for me personally in my life, it's so easy for me to kind of look down upon myself when I compare myself to others. Oh man, I'm not as talented as this person. Oh man, I don't know the word as much as this person. But you know, when we we need to strip ourselves out of that uh, mindset and out of that thinking of, of really comparing people because we need to focus on the truth, you know, that God sees us in the best that we can. I feel like, you know, God sees us in the best way that he can more than I could see myself. And to me, that gives me so much you know, it just it just gives us so much admiration to know that our God sees us with so much love. He, I feel like he loves me more than I love myself at times. And so, you know, as I grow to have an understanding of the love that God has for me, as I grow to have an understanding of how he sees me, you know, it also switches the way that we look ourselves, the way that we look at each other, the way that we look at, you know, other people. You know, when we start to see that, you know, God loves this church, God loves the people uh, that we go to school with. God loves the people that we go to work with. God even loves the strangers that we pop, walk and pass by. You know, it really switches our paradigm and it really switches the way we act when it comes to interacting with people, when it comes to interacting with our family members. Because when we know that each person that we interact with is beloved by God and he sees them with such you know, endearing eyes, you know, that should encourage us to also respond in love to those that we encounter, to those that we have experiences with, because, you know, our God, you know, sees us with so much love. He sees us with so much admiration and, you know, it is in his heart and it is in his heart and it is his hope that we also see each other with that same type of love. Amen. And so knowing this, when we sin or trip up, let us immediately go to the Father and ask for repentance. You know, oftentimes many believers avoid God when they sin. You know, I've done this personally because I think, you know, that 
God will look bad upon me, you know, for my mistake. You know, a lot of us think that when we sin, God will look bad on us when we do our mistake, you know, but this type of thinking causes us, you know, it even this type of thinking is so dangerous. You know, when we think that God will look down upon us when we sin, you know, this type of thinking and this type of mindset is so dangerous because it causes us to drift farther away from God and even open up to him and allow more sin to enter our lives. You know, when we think that, you know, God will be angry at us when we think that God will, you know, lash out on us when we come to him, you know, that demotivates us, you know, that motivates, that demotivates us to even encounter him, to even go to him. And so I pray that, you know, what I, when we do get those types of thinking, let's, uh, let's cast those away and let's remember the truth, you know, that God looks at us as, and God sees us as his beloved. And, you know, when we have an understanding of that, when we do sin and when we do fall, rather than the first thought being, oh my gosh, you know, God, God's going to be so angry with me. You know, our first response is, is, you know, God, I'm so sorry. You know, we come to him immediately. We come to him to encounter him so that we may be cleansed and we may be set free from the sins and the, and the, and the wickedness, you know, that we have committed. And so, uh, so when we do wrong before God, let it be reminded to us that he still sees us as his own. You know, he still sees us as one of his children. He still sees us as the bride of Christ. Uh, when we come to repentance before him, you know, our mistakes don't define who we are. You know, our mistakes don't define uh, how we are, how we're going to live our, our, our life for the rest of our lives. You know, instead, God defines who we are and he sees us with eyes of love, which illuminates our beauty to him. You know, as sinful as we are, as uh, as you know, the sinful nature that we once had before, you know, when we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior, you know, God has always seen us with eyes of love. He has always seen us as his children. You know, when uh, we were thinking, when we were, when we were singing, uh, and we were, and when we, we were, when we were listening and when we were singing, you know, that offering song, Reckless Love of God, he even says there, when I was your foe, still your love fought for me, right? And so even when we were enemies of God, even when, even when we were even foes of God, because he looks at us with so much love, because he looks at us with so much adoration. You know, he fought for us. He even gave his one and only son to die on the cross for us, just so we can return to him and give him the love that he desires from us. Amen. And so let's go to the next point, number four. It says here, when God loves us, he will discipline us. And, you know, to me, and this part of my notes, I guess it was one of the more difficult uh, things to uh, really kind of dwell with. Uh, not so because it's not like I don't want to be disciplined, but you know, for me, I wrestled with God when you understand with the with the understanding of you know His love for us and how He disciplines us. And so, in Proverbs three verses eleven to twelve, um, it says here, "My son." Do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor detest his correction. For whom the Lord loves, he corrects, just as a father, the son in just as a father, the son in whom he delights. And so, you know, it says there, you know, that when we are disciplined, when we are chastened by the Lord, you know, we shouldn't detest whatever he's doing, but we should delight in it uh, because he because our father de delights in those he he disciplines right and so what does it mean to be disciplined by god and so for us in order for, to understand this let's look at the why and the how and so for the why god disciplines so that we can walk in righteousness as our father god has a responsibility to train us as his children to walk in obedience towards him so that we can live a lifestyle of holiness and maturity and let us know I just want us to remember that discipline is not the same as condemnation. For we know in Romans 8 verse 1, it says there, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Discipline is all about training and growth, while condemnation deals with punishment and guilt. And we know, and we know that in our experiences with Christ, you know, it is not in his heart to guilt trip us. It is not in his heart to punish us, but as he disciplines us, it is in his heart for us to, tr to, tr to be trained. It is in his heart for us to grow in holiness, in purity, in righteousness. And so we can say that the discipline of God, you know, when, when it comes to the discipline of God, you know, it is all about 
our growth in him. It is all about our maturity in him. You know, it is not in his heart for us to feel bad about ourselves. You know, we already talked about how God sees us and how God, you know, desires for us to be the bride of Christ. And so it is not in his heart for him to condemn us, for him to look down upon us. But when he disciplines us, when he chastens us, you know, it is in, in his heart for us to really walk more in purity and holiness and righteousness. And so we can say that the discipline of God can have both positive and negative aspects. And so by negative, I mean, you know, harder to take in uh, for us individually as, as, as believers of Christ. And so the positive side, the more positive side, I guess, of the discipline of God, um, when we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior, the discipline of God begins as he leads us and guides us in the understanding of his word and how we are to live our lives. This is such a blessing for all of us because it is through this that we are prevented from the wrath of the Lord in the coming days. In Psalms 94 uh, verses 12 and 13, it says here, blessed, happy, fortunate to be envied is the man whom you discipline and instruct. Oh Lord, uh, oh Lord, and teach out of your law that you may give him power to keep himself calm in the days of adversity until the inevitable pit of corruption is dug for the wicked. And so the discipline that we are receiving now, it even says there in Psalms 94 verse 12 to 13, we are blessed, we are happy, we are fortunate. We are to be envied because we are being disciplined by God. Why? We are being disciplined so that we may avoid the wrath of God in the coming days. You know, as we've talked about before in our previous teachings and our previous postings about, you know, the coming of the Lord and how he will come in judgment and how those who are righteous will celebrate the rewards of his coming. And while those, you know, who are who are unfortunately not aligned with him will experience the wrath and the judgment of Christ. And so, the discipline that we are receiving now, the discipline that we are, you know, getting now from God is something to be celebrated. It's something to be delighted in because it is through these things that we continue to walk in righteousness. And it is through that type of lifestyle, you know, that we are able to avoid, you know, the wrath and the judgment of God in the coming days. And I guess the more negative part of the, of the discipline of God is the part of God's discipline, uh, because part of God's discipline is correction, you know, when we sin. And this can be tough for all of us, because in order to have a heart that is willing to be corrected, we need to let go of our pride. And we know that our pride can be so dangerous because it could be so sly. You know, when we don't have a heart that is teachable, when we don't have a heart that even likes to acknowledge the wrongdoings that we've done, you know, God's discipline cannot work as effectively as with a heart that is teachable, as with a heart that is humble. And so when it comes to the discipline of God, it's so important for us to let go of our pride. You know, to let go of our selfishness, to let go of our self-centeredness, of our self-righteousness, because it is when we start to let go of these things that God will start to reveal to us the wrongdoings that we've done. And, you know, as hard as it is to, to see and experience those things, you know, the reward of that is we come out a more holy person. We come out a more righteous person. We come out a more pure person, you know, and it is in his heart, you know, it is in our, it is in our heart, you know, to live a lifestyle of Christ likeness, to live a lifestyle of purity and holiness. And so in this part of refinement, in this part of disciplining, you know, God really wants to refine us to be a people that is so pure, that is so holy, that is so righteous. You know, and when we continue to remind ourselves of that, and when we continue to even remind ourselves that he loves us in the, during this process, you know, rather than fearing the discipline, rather than fearing this refinement process, you know, we embrace it with open arms, you know. And so how does God uh, discipline us? You know, God has actually different methods when it comes to disciplining us. And there are many ways, you know, but here's to name a few. God may use trouble and hardship in our lives to further refine us in holiness. When we look at Job and even Paul and see the sufferings that they had to face, we see that they weren't even being corrected for their sin. You know, when we look at what Job had to go through and we look at what Paul had to go through, they weren't even being corrected. They weren't even being disciplined because of their sin, but rather they were being trained in righteousness. And this was something that was really kind of hard for me to swallow because, you know, I was wrestling with God with that idea and, you know, I was talking to him and, you know, like God, you know, even when we don't sin, even when we don't fall into wickedness, you know, why, 
would these sufferings still happen to us? Why would these, you know, bad things still happen to our lives, you know, when we are righteous before you, when we are obedient before you? But it is through those things, it is through the sufferings, it is through the trials, it is through the temptations that we face that we are being disciplined and we are being trained in righteousness. And we cannot be trained in righteousness if there is nothing opposing that, right? And so when there is no, I guess, conflict when there is no uh, sin that is tempting us, you know, how can God train us in righteousness? And while this thought and while this thought may be sometimes still challenging to take in for us as believers of Christ, we must know and we must understand that God always has a reason for anything that happens in our lives. And, and, you know, when we see that God uses this for a purpose, you know, it is for us to be trained in righteousness. It is for us to be trained in holiness and purity, for us to grow in our capacity to have faith, to have trust in Him. You know, our God desires for us to grow in these things. You know, and God may, uh, and another way that, you know, God may discipline us is, you know, God may show us the consequences of what our sin does to others. In Second Samuel 12, verses 13 to 14, um, it says here, David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, the Lord has also, has, has also, the Lord also has allowed your sin to pass without further punishment. You shall not die. Nevertheless, because by this deed, you have given a great opportunity to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme him. The son is born to you shall die certainly. And so, you know, this is a really extreme example. Uh, this is a really extreme example. And this is really an extreme example, you know, as we've seen here in the scripture that David's sin has led to the death of his child. And, you know, while this scripture still shows the, even though this sin, this scripture still is really extreme, the scripture still also shows us the brutal truth that our sins have power to affect the lives of others. And so let me just bring about a more practical example for us. You know, for me as a big brother, I believe that I have the role, I have a role and I have the responsibility to, to set an example, you know, a good example for my younger sister. And, you know, there are times um, when I would feel annoyed at something, just say with school or with uh, just anything that would annoy me, I would feel annoyed. Right. And when my parents would ask me to do something, whether it be chores and stuff, and I'm already annoyed, you know, I would always kind of respond with irritation and, you know, my sister would see this and, you know, when I respond with irritation, when I kind of respond with, with anger, like, oh my gosh, like, why are you asking me to do this? You know, I'm already dealing with this, 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 and, and you're asking me, you know, I've already repented for this. Uh, but, you know, whenever I do respond with irritation and my sister would see this, uh, you know, and then after a while, you know, God would highlight to me how my response not only created tension between me and my parents, but also misguide my sister into thinking that it's normal for children to act like that to their parents. You know, and when God reveals to you those things, when God reveals to me those things, you know, just how much my, 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 my sin or my, you know, wickedness, I guess, has really affected those around me. It gives me a deep sense of conviction and a deep sense of, 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 yeah, a deep sense of conviction that truly, you know, our actions, our words, how we interact and how we go about, you know, uh, living our life can truly affect others. And so, in, the, in a way, you know, God disciplines us in a way that when he reveals to us just how much our actions can affect others, you know, we are trained into righteousness. Once again, we are realigned, you know, to walk in righteousness because, you know, ever since that moment, you know, I always now try to always respond in love because, you know, as, as I said, as a big brother, I always want to uh, set an example for my younger sister to always respond in love. And, you know, to the best of my ability, I always I do my, I always try my best uh, to always respond in love. And, you know, it's a scary thought, you know, that our sins can lead others to sin. And it really is scary to think about that. Uh, but let us find comfort in the truth that God disciplines us to prevent us from doing that to our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ again. You know, when uh, we experience, when I experienced that thing for the first time, you know, of just how easy it is to lead others to sin in the body of Christ, um, God has really transformed the way that I live my life. 
uh, through this discipline. And, you know, now, you know, I always try to live my life, I'm always responding in love. And, you know, the reason, you know, God allows us and God shows us and reveals to us just how um, our sins impact others because, you know, he doesn't want us to do it again, you know. And for me, you know, it, it really has affected my life because I try not to be so, I try to be more thoughtful now with my relationship with others and just really trying to respond more in love and in obedience before God. And so we experience God's discipline because he wants us to mature. He wants us to increase in our capacity for righteousness he wants to, us to continue to walk on the right path and let's always remember he disciplines because he loves us you know jesus christ lived a perfect life obeying the will of the father and so it should be our desire as his followers to be in pursuit of the lifestyle that he lived living in christ living in christ likeness is no easy task but our father is more than able and is more willing to guide us by the hand in the pursuit of this lifestyle. So let us not fear discipline instead. Let us continue. Uh, so let us not fear discipline instead. Let us continue to hold on to him and allow him to pour out his love on us as he leads us to the path of Christ likeness. And so God has shown me just how much love there is, you know, when it comes to the discipline that he, that he gives me, you know, he reminds me that when also my parents discipline me, I know at the moment, it kind kind of attacks my pride, you know, and that's something that I need to let go of. And, you know, he reveals to me that he does all these things because he desires for us to live a lifestyle of holiness, of purity and righteousness. And I think it's also important for us to point out that we too need to desire this. Uh, we too need to also, you know, want to live this type of lifestyle because when we don't, discipline is something that will be so hard for for all of us to face right and so as we are disciplined as we are chast uh, as we are um uh disciplined by god let us always remember that he always does it in love he does it with a purpose and he does it with the purpose of of, of us growing closer to him amen and so for uh the fifth point that i want to share with us the last point it says here there's nothing you or anyone else can do to stop God from loving you. As a church, I want it to truly let it be known to us that the love that God has for us is relentless. You know, uh, as the reason why I picked, you know, Reckless Love as our song uh, before we started preaching is because it always shows the love of the Father for us. You know, it shows that His love is so relentless. It's so pursuant. You know, and while the word reckless is a bit, you know, extreme, you know, of course, we know that God himself isn't reckless, but, you know, when we look at his love, uh, as I'm going to share later, you know, uh, when we look at just how much, you know, he desires for each and every one of us, you know, when we were, when we really think about it, the, the, the way that we describe the love of God can't be put into words for me personally, the love of God is so strong, like I can't even fathom that this type of love is real. There are moments in my life where I sin, where I fall short. And, you know, with all the other four points that we've talked about today, how it's made real to me, sometimes I just go before God and I just can't help but think that this type of love is real, that there is a God who loves in this way, that there is someone who loves us in a way that, that he loves, you know, and, and God loves us with, with so much, you know, passion, with so much relentlessness and you know when we understand that there's a god that loves us so much in this way that he gave his one and only son to die on the cross for us you know for me like i don't know how our lives cannot be transformed i don't know how our lives cannot be so moved and led to you know follow after him and so um you know there's so much truth and i want us to continue to know as a church that there's nothing you or anyone else can do to stop god from loving you amen in Romans 8, verses 38 to 39, it says here, For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor in height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. You know, there is so much power in that scripture. 
to know that death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, you know, can ever separate us from the love of God. There is something so powerful in the scripture about knowing that nothing of the natural realm and even of the supernatural realm can separate us from the love of God. The love of God is something that, you know, as funny as it sounds, we can't escape from it. You know, you know, uh, as, as even though, you know, we, we sin even though we fall short, even though we feel like we are, have drifted so far away from God, you know, his love will always still be there for us, right? And, you know, I want to warn us that the love and the willingness, you know, uh, of God, you know, Kui Jeremy, can we go to the, the next one, the next slide? Yes, it says here that the love and the willingness to forgive that God has for us should not be an excuse to indulge in sin. But rather, let this truth allow us to open our hearts to God in a greater measure because we have confidence that no matter what wicked things are found in our heart, God will still encounter us with open arms. And this is something that I've dealt with, you know, in my growth with Christ. There are moments, you know, in my life where I sin and I'm like, oh, it's okay. You know, God will forgive me. Uh, or like when I think of sinning, like, oh, it's okay. You know, I can always come before God because he's always willing to forgive me. But I want us to know not to take this love for granted you know i don't want us to uh look at these things and think oh my gosh you know when i sin you know it's okay because god loves me like of course there is so much truth that you know god loves us that he will forgive us but i don't want us to look at look at it at the wrong way instead you know i want us to look at it in the truth that when we know the love of god you know there is so much there should be a greater measure in our confidence to come to him that no matter what sort of sin, no matter what sort of wicked thing that we've done, you know, our God will always encounter us with open arms, right? And so I don't want us to look at the love of God as some freebie type of thing. I want us to look at it with such reverence, with such, um, with such honor, you know, with such respect, because, you know, when we do take this love for granted, you know, God knows because it is it because God looks at our hearts, right? He knows the desires of our hearts. He knows the motives of our hearts. And so as we continue to uh, understand the love of God, let us continue to just allow our hearts to grow, to have a confidence, to always come before him in his presence. Um, and as we continue uh, on, you know, even when our hearts feel dry and distant from him, not only will he not stop loving you, in truth, he actually will still be in pursuit of you. And I want us to read to us, you know, Luke 15 verses 4 to 6 about the parable of the lost sheep. It says here, what man of you having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does he not leave the 99 in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my lost sheep, which was lost. And, you know, this is the type of love that the Lord has for us. He's willing to live the 99 just to go for the one. And in the, rec in the song Reckless Love, it also talks about that, you know, it leaves the 99 for the one. And uh, when we look at it, you know, at, at a human perspective, you know, like, that's the type of, I guess, recklessness that he has for us, that he's willing to leave the 99 sheep. You know, when we look at, I guess, with our earthly minds, you know, like, why would someone leave the 99, risk losing the 99 just to go for the one? But our God loves us so much that he's willing to do that. You know, he's willing to go after you, you know, and leave the 99 there. You know, he's willing to pursue you even when you don't feel like, coming to him even when you reject him again and again and again and again and again he still pursues after you and we know that that type of love is is is, is so powerful you know when we look at our human relationships you know uh when someone rejects you and you continue love and love 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 you like we think like wow that person is so weird that person like why why do you keep on doing that you know that person's already rejected you why do you keep trying to show love on them but that type of love is is the type of love that our father has for us you know no matter how much as we talked about before no matter how much we fall into sin no matter how much even we reject him from our hearts how much we reject him from our lives you know our god will still continue to pursue after us uh he will continue to run after you with the hope and with 
uh, yeah, with the hope that you know you will once again return to Him, and I want us to have a lot of comfort and faith and and trust in that, because I know for us as 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 believers, for us as foreigners for Christ specifically, I know you know that you know we we try our best to walk in holiness, purity, and righteousness, and I just want us to know that as much as we are in pursuit of God, God is also in pursuit of us, and so it's this type of 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 relationship that we have for him, that as we uh, commune with him, as we uh, unite ourselves with him, he in turn is also uniting himself with us, you know, and even when we feel like we're at our dry spell, even when we feel dry in our relationship with God, even when we feel like we don't feel his, his voice, his presence, just know and just trust in the truth that our God is always in pursuit of us. And as we embrace the truth that the God of creation has an unrelenting, pursuant love for us, let our hearts be filled with so much joy. And I believe that is why a lot of Christians who truly know the love of God are filled with so much joy despite the amount of hardships, despite the amount of of trials that they face. You know, I continue to remember the life of Paul, the amount of beatings he received, the amount of jail time, the amount of persecutions he received throughout his ministry. But yet he was so motivated to serve the Lord. He was so motivated to share the love of God because he had an under, he had an understanding that when God loves him, there is nothing else that can, you know, change and affect his life. And, you know, I, I pray that we as a body of Christ continue to grow in that, to continue to grow in the truth and continue to grow in wonder that, you know, our God loves us so much. And so, uh, Kuya, Jeremy, can you put the next slide? Yes, thank you. It says here, so what do we do when we have an understanding that God the Father loves us? I want to read to us First John 4, verse 19. It says here, we love him because he first loved us. And to me, you know, that's so powerful. You know, the reason why we do these things for God, the reason why we do our ministries, the reason why we read the word, the reason why we desire to grow in the love of God, it is because he first loved us. This is a simple yet powerful response that we as believers give him, you know, when we understand that he loved us first. And so in return, we love him back. You know, that's so simple, but it's so powerful when it comes to our relationship with him. God loves us and pours out so much on us that he even gave his one and only son to die for us so that the invitation to love him back opens up. This is what it, that, this is what it means when it says that we love him because he first loved us. Because he first loved us, he created the world, he created the universe, he created all these miraculous and beautiful things so that we may enjoy it. When Adam and Eve sinned and, and we as a humanity fell into wickedness, he first loved us that he gave his one and only son so that he may die on the cross for us and the invitation to commune with him, to be one with him again, to unite with him, to love him again opens up. He first loved us that he is the one who pursues after us, you know. Before, you know, I was really serious, before I, I became serious in my faith, you know, I was I I wasn't really you know pursuing God pursuing um, righteousness purity holiness you know I had an encounter with God because of His pursuant love for me you know when we have these encounters with God let us continue to remind us that it is through those encounters that He reminds us that He's in pursuit after us and because of His pursuit after us you know we in turn love Him in return and like what I said before it is a simple. Um, response, but yet it is so powerful because to love him, you know, with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength requires for us to let go of ourselves, our emotion, our own uh, desires, our own wants, and we instead have a hold of his heart, his desires, his wants for us. Amen. And so there's nothing that the father wants more than for his children to return to him in unity through love. The reason why. You know, God did all these things. The reason why he's bringing forth judgment, the reason why the end times, we are reading about the end times the re, uh, and, 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 and learning about, you know, what will happen in the, in the last days. It is because everything that he is doing, it is so that 
we can be one with him again. It is so that we can come into unity with the Father once again. You know, when we continue to look at us as the bride and Jesus as a bridegroom, you know, when it is his desire for us to come in communion once again with his son, to come in unity with his son as we, you know, marry the lamb. You know, it is in his heart and it is in his greatest desire for him to love us. And when we see that the heart of the father is one of his greatest desires is for him to just love for us to love him back. You know, it really shows the heart that God has for us. You know, our God is so powerful. Our God can, can change things in an instant. You know, he could be a God that could just make us, you know, his servants and just do things, all these things for him. But no, he sees us as the bride of his son. And when we talked about before, you know, with Mike Bickle about ruling with him, you know, when heaven comes down on earth, you know, it really shows his heart that he has for us, you know, his, his selfless love for us, you know, he is, our God is so powerful, but yet most like his love is continued uh, to be poured out on us and to us alone, right? And so let's just continue and let's just continue to discover and continue to search and dig deeper to the truth of, of his love for us. As we continue to grow in the understanding of the love that God has for us, it is my prayer that we grow in capacity to love him even more. You know, even after this preaching, this teaching, you know, I pray that we continue to dive and dig deeper into the love of God. I pray that we may continue to ascend in the understanding of the love that God has for us. Because when we continue to understand, when we continue to know the love that God has for us, we continue to grow in capacity to love of even more. You know, and as we grow in capacity to leave him, to, to love him more, as we grow in capacity to love him more, you know, there, there's something that stirs up in our hearts to want to serve him more, to want to read the word more, to want to spend time with him more, you know, and eventually our whole lives will be truly dedicated to him and to grow in the capacity to love him. You know, it is a process. It is a journey, but it is a journey that he is leading us and guiding us through. And as, as believers of Christ, I truly pray and I truly hope, and it is in my prayer that as we continue to have an understanding of his love, I pray that we continue to grow in our love for him, in our love for each other, because times now are getting more wicked. Times now are getting more sinful. And the only way that we as a body of Christ can truly, you know, combat that wickedness, that sin is through love. You know, love is a powerful weapon. And when we continue to show the world just how much we as believers of Christ love, you know, I truly believe that we can open up their hearts to also receive the love of God and also love God in return. And so I just pray that may the response in love, may the response of God's love for us to all, I pray that, you know, when we understand that God loves us, I pray that we may grow in the response to love him even more. I pray that we may grow to have a lifestyle and cultivate the lifestyle of responding in love. I pray that that may be made alive in our hearts. Amen. Amen. So, uh, Father God, I just want to thank you, God, for today. I just want to thank you, Lord, for this message of understanding the love that you have for us. I thank you, God, for your pursuant love for us. I thank you, Lord, that that there, that life, nor death, nor principalities, nor powers can ever separate us from the love that you have for us. I pray, oh God, that you continue to 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 give us revelation lord of your love for us i pray that we may grow in wonder we may grow in admiration lord of your love for us the love that we are experiencing now as crazy as it sounds it's just the tip of the iceberg there is so much deeper intricate things about your love for us there is so much more that we can ascend in about your love for us oh god and i just want to thank you that your love for us is endless it is relentless and i thank you that we could discover so much more lord about your love for us i pray oh god the things that we've heard now the things that we've heard today lord may not just go one year and out the other but i pray oh god that the things that we've talked about and discussed today lord may be deeply rooted in our hearts i pray oh god that as they take root and as the seeds lord of your word have been planted in our hearts I pray, oh God, that they may grow, Lord, and that they may bear fruit, Lord, as seen as how we live our lives.
I pray that we may continue to respond in love. I pray that we may continue to act in love. And we know, Father, and we have an understanding that doing this requires an understanding of your love for us. And so, Father God, we just want to thank you for the comfort of your love. We just want to thank you that your love for us continues to overflow. And I pray, oh God, that we may continue to abound more and more in love. I pray, oh God, that love may continue to transform that we live the way that we live our lives. I pray, oh God, that our relationship with you, Lord, the way that we see you, the way that we see you in our weakness, Lord, may be changed, Lord, when we continue to remember your love. I pray that in times of weakness, in times of sin, in times of failure, may your love for us continue to remind us, God, that we could still continue to keep going. We can still continue in our journey, Lord, of discovering what it means to have a relationship with you. I pray, oh God, that we may carry, Lord, your love for us, Lord, and run with it this race, Lord. I pray, oh God, that especially now as a body of Christ, as we have been talking about the end times, Lord, as scary as it may sound and as and as intimidating as the end times may be lord i pray oh father that we continue to remember that all these things are happening because you love us and we are doing all these things oh god because we love you and i pray oh god that there may be transformation lord in the global body of christ oh god to receive this love and i pray that to those here in this meeting today and to those who are listening to the broad grass, I pray, oh God, I pray that you may be able to receive the love of God that, that, that he has for you. Whether you are an unbeliever, I pray that he may enter into your life and that you may be, be able to experience a love that is so beautiful, that is so miraculous and marvelous. And even when we are beginning in our relationship with God or even well into the years in our relationship with God, I pray that we may have a greater revelation of his love for us because there is so much more to his love than what we know now. And Father, we just want to thank you, O oh God, for what you have revealed to us today. Continue to uh, deeply root these things in our hearts, O oh God. And we just want to continue to give you all the praise, all the glory, all the honor, all the worship, Lord. We praise you. We love you and we magnify your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.